Hi, I'm Manupam Mittal. I'm the founder of People Group, uh, which has built companies like Shadi.com, Makan.com, and so on. I'm also a very active angel investor and have invested in over 100 companies uh, until now. I've led perhaps 10 or 12 of these. In all, it's been a very interesting journey. I started out in, I'd say, 2000 and Six was probably my first angel investment, but I didn't even know it was called angel investing at the time. It was simply an opportunity that I saw and, uh, you know, invested in that company, led around subsequently we got Sequoia into that company. And that company actually became Interactive Avenues, which became India's largest digital ad agency, which we sold uh, for a wonderful exit in 2013. In 2011 is when I formally started angel investing, or at least I learned about what angel investment as a term means and what a lead investor is and uh, since then I got very active and have uh, made over 100 investments so far. My broad thesis is that uh, angel investing can oftentimes be zero or one and so it can be very binary outcome and hence one has to be very broad based in terms of taking bets. There are so many variables that one is stacked up against that you could essentially choose the best team, the best space, the best market, but still end up failing. So the broad thesis is to really go as wide as possible and then kind of double down in the companies that are working and, you know, go past or not rue the losses or rue the ones that are not working. So that's the kind of uh, broad thesis that I've used so far and it's worked pretty well. I think over the last, uh, I guess it's been a decade now, I, if I'm not mistaken, the realized IRR is north of 45% and the unrealized is north of you know, close to 70%. So all in all, it's been a great asset class for me. Typically, we are the first check into a company or right after the friends and family round. So a lot of times our companies have not found what we call product market fit, which means they have a broad idea of the space that they want to be in. They have a sense of the product that they want, but they haven't been able to profitably sell that product or the unit economics are not yet making sense. And that's probably the biggest challenge in the initial stage, I would say, right after the seed round. That's where a lot of my energy goes as a lead. What we try to do is work with the entrepreneurs to <clears throat> really continue to tweak the proposition and the product. Sometimes the positioning isn't right. Sometimes the product itself is not right. Sometimes the target market is not right. So we spend a lot of time working with the entrepreneurs, trying to tweak these things. Uh, the, you know, the interesting thing here though is or the biggest challenge I, I should say here is that there are no answers. We live in a very rapidly changing world and while some of us have many years of experience, it's almost foolish to apply that experience to companies that are just forming because the rules are changing every day. The digital connectedness and the internet are sort of ensuring that the old rules don't apply anymore. So the best that we can do when trying to find product market fit is to really develop a very strong learning agility in the founding team and a culture of experimentation. So you try a lot of different things, you learn quickly, you fail fast, you feel fail forward. And, uh, and hopefully during that process, you're able to uh, you know, hit upon something that clicks. Sometimes it's broadly in line with what you first imagined, but sometimes it can be something very, very different. And the entrepreneurial team should be ready to embrace that and, and be able to move forward on the, new, on the new journey. Besides the product market fit, I think the key challenge uh, at the seed stage becomes to define the milestones for the next round. Uh, in today's world, capital is becoming a key differentiator. A lot of spaces can only take two or three players and so it's important that the team understands the urgency in being the first uh, or amongst the first to raise the next round of capital because if your competitor raises a lot more capital than you have then it's going to get harder and harder and harder. So you have to be first up the block 
in a lot of ways. And so that's the other sort of area that uh, I spend a lot of my time working with entrepreneurs in terms of how to think about that. One of the important things uh, once we come into a seed round is to sort of plan out the next milestone, plan out the next raising, the next round of capital because the competitive intensity that we operate in uh, a lot of times uh, requires us to raise a lot more capital than the competition. Now often when it comes to that, uh, you know, the entrepreneur turns to you for advice in terms of what to negotiate, how to deal with the new investors, uh, who to target. And I think that's all very well, uh, given the experience that we have in these areas, we're able to lend a lot of perspective to the entrepreneur who might be doing it or most often is doing it for the first time. I think what I personally try to stay away from is being involved in the negotiations directly with the new VC. Uh, I'm guiding and helping the entrepreneur in the background, uh, but I think ultimately the VC wants to interact with the entrepreneur. And so as an angel investor, as a lead investor, if I put myself uh, before the entrepreneur when dealing with VCs, it kind of takes away from the entrepreneur. Uh, so I personally prefer that the entrepreneur himself is dealing with the VC, with me or us helping in the background, depending on uh, who the VC is. Uh, sometimes we have to jump in, and usually it's when we've hit a stalemate. If our rights are getting compromised severely, uh, or materially, particularly because as a lead investor, I'm also representing uh, the rights of other co-investors. I have a fiduciary responsibility towards them. And, uh, and so once we actually have an offer from a VC for the next round or, or another investor for the next round, that's when I kind of jump in a lot of times to ensure that our rights are intact or we are not uh, signing something that could be very onerous to us in the future. We are not compromising away our economic rights in any way. So I think that's sort of where, where an angel or a lead investor comes in. So when we talk about governance, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's very important uh, having done this for so long, I've actually seen all types of governance, all shades of governance, uh, right from uh, founding teams that, you know, have not paid any attention to it. And understandably so, because a lot of these people are doing it for the first time. Their focus really is on building out the business, building the product, getting things done. They don't pay as much attention at that particular time to keeping investors for, informed or uh, ensuring that the financial uh, administration or governance is right. And so, uh, as investors who've been there before, who've built companies before, who've been involved with other companies, I think it is our primary duty to bring that sense to the founding team. And uh, there are two or three things really that uh, I try and do. One is, first and foremost, I try and set a schedule uh, that, in terms of business reviews, so whether that is monthly, uh, in certain cases, bi-monthly, when it's very early on. Uh, in many cases, quarterly. Whatever the schedule might be that one mutually agrees, I think it's very, very important that one adheres to it. Broadly speaking, of course, sometimes you change the date, that's not the point. The point is that you regularly uh, review and assess the business and the metrics and your milestones. So I think that's one immediate thing that I do once I come into a company. The second part is to define the metrics. And I think that's really a very, very important aspect of uh, governance. It's easier said than done. Uh, often metrics are dynamic. Often it's very, not very clear in terms of what metrics you should be tracking. Uh, I think one has to cut through all the clutter and arrive at a set of truth metrics, high level five to 10 metrics that give a completely unbiased view of the health of the business. And that is something that should be uh, uncompromisable. That is something that we should review or we tend to review uh, very regularly 
as often as we can and, and help the founders sort of align with them and, and stay honest to them. So I think that's the second aspect of uh, bringing in good governance, defining the truth metrics and adhering to monitoring and measuring them. The third one is uh, simply about keeping co-investors informed. I think uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, founding teams, once they raise the capital, they feel like their job is done. And understandably, because as I said, a lot of them are doing this for the first time, and they think their job is just to build out the product. And a big part is, but keeping co-investors informed doesn't take that long. And uh, uh, you know, if you keep them informed, proactively what one finds particularly when there's a crisis is that these are the people that you will need and if they're informed and they're plugged in they're more sympathetic towards your cause uh, they know what's going on so they're immediately able to jump in and do whatever it takes uh, so that's the third thing that i try to uh, instill into founding teams and entrepreneurs uh, so other than that i think uh, you just look for the right team uh, you look with people, you look for people with high integrity, high levels of transparency, and high learning agility. And if you have those things, then to some degree, governance uh, is ensured.